So, in the previous video I said that's everything for the bones. Um, did manage to forget these two bones of the shoulder girdle, uh, which at the time that I've recorded this, we haven't spoken very much about, so we are going to talk about this more in class, but I need something here if, um, if we're going to talk about the muscles of the back, which I am, because you know the rhomboids are attached to what I'm making here is a scapula. So, um, one, one way that uh, I mentioned you can look at the scapula is, and this is the way that Stephen Rogers Peck has it, is like this, you look at this like, um, like, okay, so, so this is what I'm making here is like a spade for gardening, right? Like you're working in the garden, you get getting the soil out of pots, something like that, and then he takes that handle and he gonk, 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 breaks it over, some, something like that. And so that gives you the spine of the scapula and the triangular body of the scapula. So it's, if that helps you remember it, then, then fine. If not, uh, let's look at some other ways. So, I mean, I'm looking at the triangle, the, the scapula basically as a triangle. And the things that I'm most interested in are this border here, that's the medial border. And then through here, this is the spine of the scapula. And this is a bony landmark. And this is what comes round and touches the clavicle. So you've got something like this going on. This really reaches forward, right? Because it's touching the clavicle and the clavicle is a bone on the front. So what you have is a bone on the back of the body that has to touch a bone on the front of the body. So the clavicle is going to go backwards and the scapula is going to go forwards, something like that. And like I say, because this is a bony landmark, this is always going to be present. If the muscles around it are very big, then it's going to be a depression. If the muscles around it are small, then it's going to stick out. This isn't a bony landmark, but we do see it in life. Now, as I come from the side view, you see how that's so straight. It's not going to be that straight in real life because it's sat on the rib cage and it has to curve around the rib cage. So we have a curve through there and then a little bit of a curve through here. Now we have this little triangle on top of the, above the spine, which we're not, it does impact the form a little bit. We're not that interested in it. And then we have this big triangle on the bottom. Um, if you're looking at a horse or a dog or something like that, actually those triangles become about the same. But for us, um, this is th this. There's a little muscle that we'll look on at some point. I think that that sits above that and it grabs hold of the humerus and it pulls the humerus up. Um, by the way, that's the supraspinatus. Supra meaning above, and this muscle through here, big flat muscle there, it's called the infraspinatus. Infra meaning below. So supra above the spine, spinatus, uh, infra below the spine. So, you know, the names of muscles, it's always useful to know that, kind of helps. Um, and then through here, what we'll have is a muscle that we're going to look at a lot more when we, when we, sorry, not a muscle, but a bone that we're going to look at a lot more when we come to um, look at the arms, because the biceps is grabbing hold of this, as well as the, the coracobrachialis, another muscle of the arms. So this is... Um, this is called the coracoid process. And it's named coming from like a, a crow's beak. And so it's just this, this sharp form that points through the body. And the, the pectoralis minor, we mentioned this a little bit in class, just briefly. Pectoralis minor, again, a muscle of the front of the body is grabbing hold of that. So you think, you think of the scapula being on the back and having a muscle on the chest grabbing hold of it. And that kind of holds it all together because the shoulder has a lot of um, flexibility, but not much strength. So it's doing everything it can to kind of strengthen that. But if you're going to dislocate a joint, it's much more likely to be your shoulder than your, uh, than your hips because as we look at the scapula through here, or if we study this area, this, um, this is a kind of, what, like a teardrop shape, something like that. Um, this, that's called the glenoid cavity. And that is where your humerus is articulating, which we're not going to look at this term. We're not going to look at right now. But you see how small it is and shallow it is compared to the hips. Well, I mean, it's about the same size at the moment, but only because the scapula is, um, you know, three times bigger than it should be, or twice as big. So the scapula should be about half the height of the rib cage, and you know the sternum is half the height of the rib cage as well. So that means that we can just approximate that, something like that. Stick that on the back. And then this um, plane break that we found in the rib cage there, that's when, the, when the, the scapula is in a relaxed position, that's where the scapula is going to be, or when the arms are in a relaxed position. Just 
making it a little bit more triangular. And it's important that it doesn't touch the rib cage itself because the serratus muscle is going to be pushing out uh, underneath that. Here I'm going to have to rotate it to point it forwards because the scapulas need to reach forwards because they need to touch the clavicles. So if I make a clavicle, clavicle is much easier to understand. So where's it gone? Okay, here we go. So length of the clavicle, I would say about two thirds of a head, something like that. It's fairly flat from top to bottom. but it gets thicker at either end. Most long bones do this, right? And a long, by long bone, I mean the bones of the arms and the legs and the fingers and the toes. Um, and the scapula, uh, sorry, the clavicle, I would define as a long bone as well. Right, basically it has a thin body and it flares out at either end. Now, the um, mistake that a lot of people are gonna make with the, with the clavicle is to make it completely straight like this. Because oftentimes when you look at it in life, it does look quite straight. But what I want you to do is to take this top view and to see how it's forming that S-curve. Right, so that S-curve is kind of the shape of the neck. You want the clavicle to wrap around the neck. Now, I've got a big distance that I need to cover here. So, um, so I've made some sort of mistake. I don't think it's in my rib cage. Um, it's partly in my clavicle. My clavicle can angle back a bit through here. And then I think my scapula has got to come out a little bit wider. So, Here's the relationship between the scapula and the clavicle. I have to lower my scapula a bit. Okay, something like this. So, clavicle comes out fairly horizontally. It's going to angle down more in the female uh, because the rib cage is narrower. So, you might see something like that. Um, I find that you see that less in real life and more in figurative art or how the females have historically been depicted because if you drop that through there then what's going to happen is it's going to make the neck look longer so you think of like a, a da vinci neck or something like that on a female it just feels like it goes on forever and part of that is dropping the clavicles through there so you can feel this on yourself right you start by feeling that there follow your finger through to the end boom at the end you'll see a little drop down and that is the chromium process here so these will always touch, always, unless you, unless you have an injury and you break those apart. So the shoulder girdle is attached to the, to the sternum through here, and or the clavicle is attached to the sternum there, and then it's fused to the, to the um, scapula there. But to think about the movement of this, right? If the, the clavicle goes up like that, imagine you're, you're pulling your shoulders up to go like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how the shoulder girdle moves. Well, that's going to be that movement. Right, something like that. Oops. So the, these points will stay in contact through there and the scapula will come straight upwards. But let's say you, instead of pulling your shoulders up, you raise your arm like you're pointing to, to the sky, then that's going to rotate, but also that's going to rotate. So you'll see something like that happen. We'll look at this more when we look at the arm, but it's kind of important. And if you do that, try, try this. Um, point, point up to the sky and then reach around your body and feel outside, like feel the side of your, the back side of your rib cage through there. You'll feel your scapula. Like this is sticking out too much, but it does stick out into the silhouette when the arm is raised. So that's the basic movement of the, of the clavicle and scapula. Um, so the, the clavicle itself can go up can't go down from this point really um, and it can slide forwards and it can slide back in like that and it can rotate like that so pretty um, complex complex movement but the way I try and keep it all together in my head is just knowing that the clavicle has to touch the body there and it has to meet the scapula through there so I sort of um, what like I when I'm figuring out the the position of the shoulder girdle, the position of the arm, I just make sure that this all makes sense and it's still attached to the body and it's still fused to the body. Okay, so 
I'm pretty sure I haven't forgotten any bones this time. Um, well, you know what? Maybe the spine. Let's let's put in the spine, and then in the next video, I promise we will get onto uh, get onto some sexy muscles. So, for the time being, let me just make a very quick spine, and this is just going to allow me to talk about the things that I think are very important in the spine. So one is that it isn't straight up and down like I'm making it. That's going to be really important. Gets thicker, by the way, as you um, as you get to the bottom. So it's going to be fairly thin up here, and then the more weight it has to support, the thicker it's going to get. Okay, but here's the important thing. It's coming backwards through here as the rib cage pushes it back, but then it's diving forwards here to support the rib cage in the head. And here, this is going to be a little bit too high, but this is if we had the skull through here. This would be inserting halfway across the skull, again to support the weight of the skull there. So what we're seeing is uh, a movement where, an S movement, right, where this curve gets stronger the further it gets down the body. It's certainly not um, vertical, you certainly don't want to have movements like that from the side view of your body, um, and it's certainly not just located at the back either. It's, if this was a very thin person, the front of that spine would be almost halfway across the body. So. Just think about how much it's pushing through there. Um, I don't really have proportional rules for this. I think, um, yeah, in some of the books they do, and I can't remember because I never use it. It's like it's like three heads and a, and a bit maybe. But the thing is, I kind of go well. It's it's the length of my rib cage plus the length, you know, plus this little bit of the hips. I know what that distance there should be, and I know what the distance of the neck should be, which we'll look at more when we look at the neck. So. Um, so I'm never like measuring out how many heads high the spine is. That feels, that feels odd to me, but maybe, maybe it doesn't to you. Anyway, that's all the bones. So next video, we will take a look at